We have a mission today, three things. Link this, these E's together, energy, the economy, and the environment. Look at supply. What are the time scales and the time frames and, and really some of the challenges there? And finally, look at efficiency and energy security and talk a little bit about how we can get our hands around this. And hopefully we'll have a bit of fun along the way. This is what it's all about. And John already mentioned it, people. Here's the population. You go back to 1980, just three decades, and it was below 5 billion. We just passed 7 billion. We're adding about a billion people every 13 years to the Earth. And here is energy demand, global all-in energy demand. It tracks it pretty closely. It's been up in the last few years as non-OECD nations industrialize and consume more energy per person. So it kind of sits here. People and energy consumption are tightly linked. Let's look a little bit how that's distributed then. In the OECD countries that develop, we've been increasing energy consumption, but if you look at a forecast out to about 2030, and forecasts are simply that, but it projected to be flattening substantially in, uh, in the Europe, the United States, and other developed nations. Here's the non-OECDs, those that are developing on the same scale, okay? Uh, just a little higher than, than uh, the developed today, but on a trend that is very steep, again, several billion people that are just getting access to energy for the first time and developing their economies. If you look specifically at China and the U.S., and so this is kind of a graph. I just got it out of The Economist uh, maybe like a couple weeks ago. It looks at big things that we do and when China overtook or will overtake the U.S. So to the red numbers on the upper half, it already did, and it shows the year, and then a ratio of how much bigger China is than the U.S., and then the ratio down the middle is how much smaller and the projection of which year it's expected to overtake. So GDP, and finally the last one down there is defense spending, okay, in 2025. It's currently 20% of the U.S. So these this huge um, change that's going on globally right now in terms of demand and consumption centers is very real. Let's look at lots of the nations. So this is a little different look. It's per capita energy consumption against per capita um, revenue. Okay. So how much money you cons uh, do you make versus how much energy do you consume? And we've plotted 25 years of data on there by nation. And the U.S., the U.S. us, is up in the upper right-hand corner, consuming the most energy per person and making the most money per person. The challenge with this is, of course, there are about 3 billion people that live down here in that lower left quadrant, currently without a lot of access to energy and not very wealthy. But they want to become wealthy. They want to develop and industrialize and grow, and they should be able to do that. If they do it the way us did, the U.S. are going to consume a heck of a lot of energy. All right. It'd be great if those three billion people could industrialize without consuming much energy. That's kind of the, you know, the holy grail, if you will. Had never happened in the past, not to say it can't, with efficiency and perhaps new invention, but not as likely. In the data, data though, you do see this rollover. You see nations and individuals becoming more wealthy and consuming less energy. The U.S. on a per capita basis is starting to come down, and certainly on a ratio per capita and GDP, a good decrease in that. So you're starting to see that roll over, and you're going to see some changes there. But it's still the population of the Earth continues to grow, and that's the big driver. Coming right into the U.S. then, this is the U.S. GDP. Below the line are recessions. Above the line are reasonably healthy economies, and this is the price of oil. Price of oil is a proxy for energy consumption. It's in dollars of the day, so if you take inflation out of it, it looks like this. And you can see that each time the price of oil spiked steeply, the U.S. went into a recession. In fact, six of the last global, seven global recessions were preceded by a spike in the price of oil. Now, those of you in science and business and others know that correlation is not causation. It's more complex than that. But there's certainly an interesting relationship here in energy underpinning economies. It's kind of fun to see who is in power during those years. Um, Mr. Ford was never elected, but he wasn't re-elected. Uh, Carter was not, and neither was Mr. Bush 41. Company, the country was in tough times in each of those, and the president was not re-elected. 
when, when the economy is in pretty good shape, the president was reelected. And we're in an election year this year, and let's see where that goes. Okay. Healthy economies with low energy prices. Mr. Clinton had some pretty good years, eight good years of energy prices plus the dot-com boom. So very healthy uh, economy. Let's look at supply. How are we going to do this? This is a complicated graph. I'm going to build it for you. You're going to see it several times, and you'll understand it as it's built. We consume energy simply in commercial, industrial, residential end uses, heating and cooling and lighting, and we move ourselves around. That's what those four gray boxes are. The numbers here are in quadrillion BTUs, but you probably can't see them even if you knew what a quad was. Uh, a, luckily, one quad is about the same as an exajoule, if that helps you. Um, yeah, we'll put it, let's put it in TCFs. One quad is about one TCF of gas. So you can read these in TCF energy equivalents. The width of the bar here on all of these is also relevant to its size. So electricity feeds all the consumption centers, not so much in electric vehicles yet, pretty thin line. Oil is king in transportation, right? And transportation relies largely on natural petroleum. Biomass goes into a lot of the sectors, not very wide. Coal still king in power production, about a less, little less than half now. Natural gas is the most versatile fuel. It feeds electricity generation and all the demands uh, centers. Here's geothermal, wind, hydro, the dams, nuclear. I used to say nuclear uh, for eight years. A different president. Um, I'm bilingual. Uh, who knows what I'll say by January, you know. But you can say it either way. They're both official. Uh, and solar, okay. So width, all the sources, inputs, and end uses. And out of that comes work, things that we do with energy that are useful. So what we're going to do is step through these uh, systematically, starting with the foundational energies, oil for transport and coal for electricity generation. Go up to the Powder River Basin. Some of the, you know, the U.S. has a lot of coal. Huge mines for coal, and by huge, I mean you, you, it's hard to get a feeling for scale there. This is one of the front scoops. Uh, that scoop actually would fill a train car, one scoop per train car. Those trucks look kind of small relatively, but the tires on them are 12 feet tall, 100 grand a, a tire. The scoop alone is $1.3 million. That's a 400 ton payload, and it goes over to these giant silos, I mean giant silos, but that's only six hours of supply. It's literally mine mouth to train in six hours, 24-7, 365. They send 520 car trains a day out to the world, mostly the U.S., but even to China now, of coal. Tremendous amount of coal. Um, some of the challenges of coal are, are uh, well, I'll talk about that in just a second. So where does the coal go? It goes down here, right? It goes to the Parrish Power Plant, northeast, or southeast of Houston. This is the largest power plant driven by coal in the country. There's four giant burners. We're standing on a mountain of coal here, and there's also four natural gas burners. The trains go away empty back to Wyoming, to the Powder River Basin, to get refilled and continue this consumption cycle. And this is a mountain of coal. It goes on for a long way. That's kind of their, uh, their reserve or their supply. It's a very large um, piece of equipment up on top. And, and uh, it's kind of hard to get a feel for scale there. Comes in, and what does it do? You boil, you burn coal, boil water, make steam, turn a turbine, and make electricity through a switchyard and out to Houston. Close to two, three million people that this uh, power plant will supply, okay? Electricity, a lot of it's generated with heat. You're burning something to boil water, make steam, or you're turning something to turn a turbine. That's how it, for the most part, is made. So tremendous industry. It's available, it's affordable, and it's reliable. And those are some of the underpinning tenets of secure energy. That's why we use a bunch of it. What are the challenges with coal? I'll do a green box like this for every energy source I'm going to show you. So I'm not picking on anybody, or I'm picking on everybody. Okay. Mining impacts are real. The one you saw on the powder, they actually reclaim that. They fill it. They're moving three Panama canals of material every year. 
but they refill it, reclaim it, put the topsoil back on, replant. You don't know that it was there, same in our lignite mines in Texas. But not everything's like that. There's mountaintop removal, et cetera. CO2 is very real. You combust coal, you get carbon dioxide, so quality, SOX, NOx, mercury, much better than it has been in the past, still a ways to go. Uses a lot of water, mostly for mining and cooling. So go to oil. This is a plot of the resources of oil, not reserves, but estimated resources in billions of barrels, so that's out to 10 trillion barrels, against the production cost. So what it's showing to the left of the white line is that's the, the total oil we've consumed in the world to date, all in, about 1.3 trillion barrels. To the right of that white line are estimates of what's left, oil and oil equivalents. It's a lot of oil left in the world at the right price with continuing advances in technology. You heard about peak oil, it hasn't happened. You've heard about peak oil since about 1859. We continue to hear about peak oil, okay? Hasn't happened, and there's a lot left. It's not that it's a renewable resource, it's not. Oil production eventually will plateau and, and decline. A lot depends on economics and technology. The Middle East, North Africa, and other conventional sources of oil are still big. We filmed out on the Perdido platform, which is the deepest water platform in the world at the time, and 8,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. Spectacular facility. 20 wells, the rig on board, and it produces as well. Lots of conventional oil left in the deep waters around the world, okay? And other places, too. How about the unconventionals? Heavy oil and oil shales. So more expensive but adding substantial amounts, over a trillion barrels in each of those. This is up in Canada. Have you heard of Athabasca tar sands? Well, they're called the oil sands now. It sounds a little softer than tar. And part of it's done by surface mining, and it's ugly, 20% plus or minus. But a lot of that resource is done with a process called steam-assisted gravity drainage, SAG-D. So they take methane or natural gas, they boil it in big boilers, they make steam, they inject the steam in the top well of a horizontal well pair, and they heat the oil, which is under the ground. And it's about the density of a hockey puck. It has to be a hockey puck. It's Canada. So everything's a hockey puck um, in Canada. Think of that, the density of a hockey puck. So they heat it with steam and get it to flow some. And that steam flows down pipelines back toward the main facility where they add more heat and methane and make it even more liquid, lower the viscosity. And, and put it in tanks and ship it out to refineries. Now that facility in the lower right corner there is a pad. They cut down trees, they actually are working in partnership with the Forest Service. And then they'll put the topsoil back on, replant it, and 20 years later you don't know that pad was there as it moves to another pad. So it's ugly where it's present, but it's not permanent, okay? So a, a pretty interesting approach environmentally to development of this. How about the oil shales in North Dakota? North Dakota has the lowest unemployment in the nation today, below 3%. They don't even unbox things at Walmart. They just leave them on the pallets in the aisles and you grab it off of that. I'm not kidding. $1,500 for a one-bedroom apartment now. Hour to wait in line for restaurants. Not everybody's that happy with that kind of growth, but most of the state's pretty happy with that kind of growth. And it's largely due to this Bakken. It's an unconventional oil, hydrofracking. They put in 10,000 foot wells down and then 10,000 foot, two miles laterally, 40 stage fracks, crack the rock and the oil flows in and they produce it. Huge potential here. It's heading toward a million barrels a day of production in North Dakota. That's what we import from Saudi Arabia in North Dakota. So you talk about energy security and getting off imported oil, this is helping to do that, okay? And it comes up to a, to a Christmas tree here and, and is shipped off in trucks and pipes. So if you look at the U.S. oil production through time, back to 1859, um, it, it did peak. It has been coming down. But on the right end there, you can't really see it because of the scale, but instead of going down to a million and a half, which was projected today, it's at two million today. That's a half, 500,000 barrels a day difference in just a few years. And that's the unconventionals that are starting to come up again. Very substantial. And we'll see where that heads. And you can see the geographic regions then and those that are really starting to take off, okay? 
What are the challenges of oil? Well, conventional oil in the world is starting to plateau. It's held largely by, tightly geographically, OPEC and some other nations. It has environmental impacts that are real from development, CO2 emissions from your tailpipe when you burn it, and then the perception, particularly in the U.S. and Western Europe, of the oil industry is not very good. The rest of the world actually kind of loves it. They take their kids in buses to oil shows, et cetera, and they're ramping up their oil and gas industries. U.S. and the Western Europe have a different spin on this. We're happy to talk about that in Q&A. And finally, pipelines, you know, um, I probably shouldn't show things like this, but, you know. <laughs> we can talk about Keystone, and I'm happy to share with you my thoughts on that. Um, this was obviously sent to me by somebody with their thoughts on it. But. Let's look at oil consumption in the U.S. then. It peaked and it, it came down. Consumption and demand track one another. We don't store, store oil very well. We don't store energy very well. Okay. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is not particularly strategic and not much of a reserve. We consume what we produce. And here we consume what we produce and import. It's been pretty flat. It dropped in the recession. You're starting to see it come back now with the recession kind of stabilizing and starting to come back up. So economies drive that consumption. Here's China's oil consumption. Same scale, same time period. So you could literally pick that up and set it back a century, and it looks just like us, right? Only, the only difference is what? About 1.3 billion people difference from when we were doing it in the U.S. compared to China. Huge demand potential in China. Largely, we put it in cars. So in the U.S., we, we uh, se sell about 15 to 20 million cars a year. It dipped in the recession down toward 10, has been coming back up. Here's China. Six years ago, a third of the U.S., today, close to double, and going nowhere but up. And I'm not, they're not electric vehicles, they're not a few hybrids, uh, some diesel, mostly gasoline engines. Okay. And those will be on the road for a couple decades. That's what it takes to turn over an auto fleet. India is the largest car manufacturer. So where there are two and a half billion people in the world, you're just starting to see this. And this is where gasoline goes. So that, that tail that I showed you of China is going to take off very steeply. Here's demand by region. North America, again, the vehicles in blue, the, the heavy trucks in orange, and everything else, aviation and marine. Europe, we're flattening again in the developed nations. And then here comes the Asia Pacific on the same scale. Today, just under North America, won't be there for much longer. And, and you can see the cars and the trucks represent probably a good two-thirds of that. That's gasoline and diesels. A lot of consumption, a lot of demand. Let's look at the light duties then. Why don't we switch quicker? Why don't we go to something else? Well, here's, this is out to a 2030 forecast. Blue is gasoline. And green is diesel, a lot of diesel in Europe. And then everything else, all the other kinds of vehicles, full hybrids, plug-ins, electrics in orange. 20 years from now. It's just a forecast. Why? because it's expensive. The alternatives are still significantly more expensive than the conventional engines, combustion engines. And we base a lot of the things we do in this world on price, okay, in the energy world. We gotta get it from somewhere, we, so we refine it. We take products like I've just shown you from conventional, unconventional, refine them. This is the Richmond refinery. It's surrounded by San Francisco in the Bay Area. You hardly know it's there. They do a tremendous environmental job. It's over 100 years old. They bring in a tanker like this every day, sometimes more. That tanker holds 750,000 barrels of oil. That's 50 Olympic swimming pools on one tanker. So I'm a professor, and I'm going to start asking questions. All right, here we go. So how much global demand does that tanker supply in time, week, day, hour? Half an hour. So I'm going to make, while you're thinking, make you feel a little better. Here's some other questions. Where was the Declaration of Independence sign? Um, at the bottom, okay? This is off the internet, so I know this one's true. Uh, 
expand this polynomial, a plus b to the n. They do, they just keep expanding it and then say et cetera there at the bottom. That gets a very funny Peter up there. And finally, for the geologists in the room like me, the explorers, find X. Well, here it is. Uh, that gets a B in my grad classes, um, just for creativity and, and a poorly written question. But, all right, so back to this one. How, how much time? Half hour, I heard. It's 13 minutes. It's not US minutes, not when it's daylight here. It's 24 7, 365. We're consuming a tanker of oil every 13 minutes okay, in the world. That's a lot. It should make you kind of get a weird feeling in your gut about how much consumption. And don't blame oil. That's what we put in transportation. We consume energy in a way you can't fathom. Okay. So I want to show you a clip from our film. In fact, uh, this is in India. There's the director filming on a very busy street in India, which you'll see in the, in the clip here when I play it for you and give you a bit of a feel for global demand. <laughs> Around then, I was asked to speak at an energy conference in India. In many ways, India is more beautiful than I had imagined. And more exotic. And more crowded. There are people everywhere, in nearly constant motion. Vehicles at every speed, on every road, at pretty much every hour of the day or night. Millions of new drivers finding new ways to fit in too few lanes. India already makes more cars than the US, and nearly all of them running on oil. very appropriate this meeting is in India. India will soon become the largest populated country in the world. It's growing and the demand for energy is growing and so many of the things that India does are going to lead the world as we move forward. All of a sudden you're creating a new middle class in China and India. That's hundreds of millions of people who don't yet have cars yeah. but know what cars are and know they want them. And so as their incomes rise, their consumption of automobiles is going to rise. And that means the world's consumption of fossil fuels, particularly oil, is going to rise. Right. But also their demand for electricity is going to grow. Yeah. One of the scariest statistics I've heard in the time I've been in this job was told to me by an Indian energy official. He said, you know, we have 600 million people in this country without access to electricity oh. today. Can you imagine? Oh providing electric, uh, what the challenge is, that's two United States. Can you imagine providing electricity for two United States? And they want to do it in the next, you know, 20 to 30 years. You know, they and they'll be, and they'll be adding coal. population at the, at, at the right. same time. Right. So, and that's going to be coal. In two or three decades, the energy demands of India and China are expected to exceed those of the U.S. and all European countries combined. In terms of the carbon emissions, uh, the U.S. will soon be a minor player in this. Most of the carbon emissions will be coming from China, India, and the developing world. We will develop carbon sequestration, but it will be too expensive. They will not adopt it. This will become a point of friction in the future, mm. which we will not solve. And assuming the calculations are right, we will have several degrees of global warming, which we will learn to live with because there will be no alternative because unless it is really cheap and affordable, the developing world cannot adopt it. And we can't afford to subsidize these huge growing nations whose economies will soon be so much larger than ours. 
coal and oil, electricity and transportation. Just as it did in the West, coal will power the development of China and India, but it will not be clean. Oil demand will increase, and so will risk, and so will price. The challenge then is not just to adopt alternatives, but to maintain the benefits of oil and coal without their disadvantages, and at a price we can all afford. Can it be done? That's uplifting. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of that falls in the middle of the film, and and I th hope that kind of sets the stage for you and gets gets you a feeling for what we're facing because that's the real world. That's the world we have to look at as we go forward. We're, let's look at alternatives. Then, what are the alternatives to oil? And we'll look at the same with electricity. We're going to start with biofuels. So we went over and looked at biofuels in Louisiana. This is Sora gro gro grows uh, 18 feet tall in four months. Huge amount of biomass. Up in New York, where the growing seasons aren't quite as great, uh, farm country-wise, you see switchgrass, there's miscanthus, shrub willow, all experimental crops, cellulosic crops, to, to take and feed into these conversion facilities and convert carbohydrates to hydrocarbons, liquids that you can put in your vehicles. A lot of neat things going on, and it's not food for fuel in this case. It's the whole plant, the stalk and everything goes into that system. The great challenges here really are water. These take less irrigation than food, and fertilizers and that kind of thing, less, but land, a lot of land. Um, certainly the conversion facilities themselves, I think that's one of the bigger challenges. They didn't call them refineries, but essentially you're looking at a chemical refinery. About every 50,000 acres is a facility to do that. A million and a half dormant acres in New York alone. 30 facilities in the Finger Lakes region? Maybe. You know. No natural gas drilling, no wind turbines. See if they welcome that. So that's a challenge. Uh, drought. Drought is a big one in scale. It just takes a tremendous amount of land when you're going, doing what nature did, which compress all that and make oil, so you're basically converting oil to gasoline instead of plants to gasoline. It's a much more accelerated equation and a lot more land to do that. So those are the challenges. How about natural gas? You can put natural gas into vehicles of different kinds. In fact, Fort Worth has gone to a completely natural gas bus system, the CNG system, 200 buses in their fleet. These are great for fleets. Central compression, come back every during the day or at night, fill them up, send them back out again. CNG is great for that. And now they're looking at some of the LNG for the over-the-road trucks because you have to get it even more dense to get enough range to matter. Electric, you've heard of that. And I remind everybody, I mean, I know you all know this, but when you're plugged in with your laptops here, you're not plugged into a primary energy source. There's no electron trees and there's no, we don't drill for electrons. You have to make them somewhere. Today we make them with coal, natural gas, and nuclear for the most part, and renewables about 10%. So when you're charging that battery, you're charging with those sources of energy today and depending on where you live. We looked at electric vehicles, got to drive a, a Tesla Roadster. You know, this is a, the sporty version of an electric car, 109 grand base price, and then you put a steering wheel on it and it goes to 150,000. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, it goes, this is on a Lotus body, it goes zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. I think we did that 11 times just to get it just right. Yeah. I, was, I don't think I got that right, Harry. We need to do that again. But it has a battery in the back, a 1,000-pound battery. Actually, it's like 7,000 batteries about the size of my finger, lithium-ion batteries. And you charge it up. It gets over 200 miles on the range. Big chemical batteries, so you've got to do something with those. In this vehicle, to replace that battery is around thirty to $35,000 about every six to eight years. The volt is much less, but still five or six grand, that kind of range. So that's a significant piece of the cost and charging it. Um, hydrogen, fuel cells. So 
you've heard about this technology. It was kind of prominent for a while. It's kind of slipped off in the U.S. again and even globally. It's a pretty neat technology. We kind of liked it, but it's not very prominent. So we don't see that it has a huge future for a while. I say just 10 years away, every year. It's just 10 more years away. It seems to be like that. Or you can go a different route. This is a different engine. This is the modern world. It's not some old picture. This goes on today. The greenhouse gases are different, um, more intense. It'd be tough, actually, to get 7 billion of these on the road today, right? You can't feed them. So you really can't go back to that in a modern world, but it exists in our modern world. And on the other end of the spectrum is something like this. This is 2,000 horsepower on the back of a rubber boat gasoline engines. That thing was going so fast across the English Channel, they sent a chopper out to figure out what it was, and they brought it in, and it was running drugs. You can see the bags on there. You have to be on drugs to get on that boat. <laughs> but this is the world we live in. This is the real world, the world that ranges from animals to 2,000 horsepower from mostly gasoline and diesel to some hybrids and things, engines of all kinds and people demanding them of all kinds. Those of you, particularly the younger folks in the room who are in the policy side of the business, this is the world you have to work with and deal with as you go forward, the realistic world, not what we would hope maybe or wish were, but the one that is. And it's a big challenge, but I think it's doable. Let's look at electricity options. So we've been consuming more and more electricity since... 1900, Edison, and it's been a steep rise. The OECD nations are starting to plateau, and the non-OECDs are growing tremendously as those five to 600 million people in India and same in China start to get access to electricity. How do we use it? Well, we do it in industry, in transportation, residential, commercial, the same ways I showed on my more complex figure. And they're all growing. The demand for electricity is growing on all sectors. By the way, my figures are all color-coded. I hadn't mentioned natural gas is always red, oil is always green, and coal is always black or gray. And here it is again. Natural gas, as you go out, is replacing coal. So it's cleaner, not clean, but cleaner than coal into that world as some of the old coal power plants go offline and they replace them. And nuclear we can talk about, but, but growing a little bit out into that future as our renewables, <laughs> tremendous growth there. Europe and North America, flat. And here comes Asia. Same scale, electricity demand. And look at the gray. That's coal. That's what Ambassador Jones said. That's coal. That's going to be coal. India has Cretaceous coal. China has Paleozoic and Mesozoic coals. They are using them. They're putting in a new power plant, commissioning one about every seven to ten days. A gigawatt power plant. They need the electricity. They're going to manufacture it. And they get it from other ways, too. Okay? So this is a real challenge. We base our decisions on power largely on price, like many other things. So left to right here is coal, natural gas, nuclear, wind, coal with carbon capture, gas with carbon capture, and solar. That's kind of a, a price per kilowatt hour basis. If you throw on a $60 per ton cost of carbon, coal doubles, natural gas goes up 50%, and the rest stay about the same. So they get more in the ballpark of one another except for solar, which is still more pricey. Now, it doesn't look like we're putting a price on carbon anytime soon, at least internationally and, and in many nations. So you can look at that and say, boy, why? Well, available, affordable, and reliable for electricity. Let's go back to this figure and look at the alternatives to coal then. We'll just work our way up. Uh, hydro, this is in Norway. Norway is unbelievable. Beautiful topography, renewable rainfall. The water flows down through these little streams. They capture it in pipelines. They get close to a power plant, which is sitting under a mountain, not on the surface, not a dam, but under a mountain. Some of the you know, 300 megawatts of turbines, three of them sitting in there. The water flows through it out into a fjord, and it evaporates and rains and just does it again. 99% of the electricity in Norway comes from hydro. Perfectly clean. It's unbelievable. And if we all had this, we'd be finished. You know, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But it, it's unique. 
Norway is unique in the world for that kind of hydroelectricity. The rest of us have dams. Go out to central Texas right now and talk to me about renewable hydro. It's tricky, isn't it? If it doesn't rain, it's tough. Water levels are down, et cetera. Uh, and then there's the land use and topography. Some people don't like dams. In fact, we're tearing some of them down now. So it's a challenge, fresh water capture. How about Iceland for geothermal? Tremendous source of geothermal. It's a, it's a geologic hotspot on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's fantastic. And they, you, you know, if you've been to Yellowstone, it looks a lot like that, only it doesn't have boardwalks and railings, so you can be a complete fool. You can walk right up to these fumaroles and stick a microphone over it, which we did. And uh, I'm just thinking, please don't fall in. You know. um, but what do they do? They drill, use oil well technology, drill down to it. They flash the hot water to steam at the surface, and they get all their heating from that. A third of their electricity just from taking steam out of these well fields down a pipeline that's not full of anything except steam and water right into the cleanest power plant we've ever been in in the world. There are no chemicals in there. They're just putting in steam, turn a turbine, take out heat and water, do it again. It's fantastic. And the president of Iceland, we were interviewing Scott, I don't understand why the world doesn't go to geothermal. <laughs> well, we'll all move here, Mr. President, because you're kind of unique. California looks like this, parts of Southeast Asia, they have that real high heat intensity. But Texas and most of the rest of the world, much different thermal gradient. So the geology matters, the ability to convert that heat to something usable industrially. Pretty cool if you look at the distributed geothermal now, though. The ability to maybe take 60 degree water with shallow wells and move it through your home like a heat pump and heat and cool. Pretty cool. We think that that might be coming. All right. It's, not, it's more expensive today, but again, with economies of scale. How about solar? California has this rooftop. They have great incentives, great sun. It all comes together, eight to 10 year payouts for this kind of thing. And even they're putting it now, instead of just parking lot covers, they put PV panels on the, on the, on the parking lots. So you can get to them, there's no trees. It makes a lot of good sense. Um, if you go to the industrial side of things over in Spain, these are these giant mirrors, about 680 of them or something like that, that focus the sun's light as heat on a tower, boils water, makes steam, turns a turbine. 11 megawatt nameplate at this one, and there are only a couple of towers like this in the world. That coal plant that I showed you at the beginning was, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 megawatts with a pretty about 85% capacity factor. This has about a 30%, so about a third usable. The sun goes down and clouds come by, okay? So scale is a big challenge with solar. That's why, partly why it's expensive. They do it with troughs instead of mirrors, these parabolic mirrors that point at oil. So they heat oil, they move the oil, the oil past water, boil it. And the cool thing there is they're moving the oil past salt or a, a, a salt brine molten salt, they call it, and store the heat until the sun goes down. And then they use the heat from that to boil more water and make more electricity in the early evening. So it helps remove some of the intermittency of the problem. And then, and, and again, this uses lots of land. That's a 50 megawatt facility nameplate. And then the biggest PV facility in the world at the time might still be Andesol, uh, 60 megawatt nameplate. So they're trying industrial scale solar here but in fact, uh, even in Spain, with the, the shape of the economy, they've cut the feed-in tariffs, and they've pretty much ended the government support for this program. Energy, the economy, and the environment are tightly linked. In times of recession, we don't invest that much in things that make good environmental sense. Can't afford to. Look at Copenhagen. So it's a, it's a tight waltz that the three E's do. Cost is the big one with solar. The intermittency is a big one. And you know, you hear it, it sounds trite. The sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. That's not trite. That's a very important thing because we use electrons as they're generated in real time. So if the wind goes, stops blowing in Texas and you were only on wind, you'd have a brownout. You have to backstop it with something. You have to partner with things that can be brought up quickly or baseload so we have the access to those electrons. Wind is uh, certainly in Denmark where we looked at it. 
and out in West Texas, giant turbines. We climbed up in one. It's great. I mean, there's a big truck in the bottom of this picture on the side. You can hardly see it. These things are now 300 feet tall with a 200-foot wingspan. That's a whole football field tall. Spectacular turbines, about two megawatt nameplate now, the big land ones for, on average. But there's the reality of intermittency. So here's nuclear, wind, and solar. And this is the generation capacity out to 2030 forecast where solar or wind may pass nuclear. But the shaded part is when you remove the intermittent component, what they actually generate. So there you see some of the challenges and how you have to backstop wind and solar with other things. What I'm driving toward here is the ability to store energy, particularly electricity. If we can crack that nut, this world changes. Then all of that becomes very usable. You store it till when you need it, and you use it when you need it, if you can do it efficiently. Okay. Here's Texas. This would be seven days in Texas. The high peaks are in the, the, you know, the heart of the afternoon when it's very hot. Nuclear in yellow, coal, natural gas in blue, and wind in green. So when the power demand comes down in the evening, the wind kicks in in West Texas, unfortunately. They're out of sync. You take all the wind by law, so you start to shut in natural gas and coal plants. When you're taking the electricity, then you bring those things up the next day. It's not real efficient. Coal plants weren't meant to be taken down on a daily basis. They're meant to just burn like your barbecue. So this is one of the big challenges of intermittency as well. Transmission, storage, materials, infrastructure. Pretty similar to the challenges of solar. So we've looked at all this stuff. What's left? There's nuclear and natural gas. Let's start with nuclear. <clears throat> we went over to France, looked at the largest reprocessing facility in the world. And, and there it is, and some of the largest cows in the world, too. I don't think they're related. But, but uh, inside that facility are three large pools, the cooling pools, if you will, for the depleted uranium spent fuel rods. And they bring them in there to Normandy, France. It's a spectacular country on boats, on trains, and on trucks from all over Europe and even Japan. We don't move it here in the U.S. They stay right with the 104 reactors. We can't get any con congressman to agree to a route that will take it somewhere, even if we had a place to take it, because Yucca Mountain is now off the table for a while. But they do it in France, and they reprocess those spent fuel rods. They take 95% of the uranium and re-enrich it and send it back, and they use it again. The volume goes down. The, in fact, the intensity goes down. It leaves just 5%. 1% of that is plutonium. They use that for generation of more power. 4% of fission products, which they vitrify or silicify and put in these, these uh, canisters and store them in 30-foot thick concrete slab that you see here. So two of those manhole covers are the power from a million people of electricity, just two. One person per year of solid waste is about the size of a nickel. Unbelievable. Not much solid waste from that process. They have three, two or three rooms, three rooms like that that stores all of the waste from all of the reprocessing. We have South Texas reactor here. We also have Comanche Peak up south, uh, outside of Fort Worth, four reactors in Texas. What are the challenges? Uh, natural and human disasters. Fukushima Daiichi shows some of the natural ones that can happen. No radiation deaths yet from that. There were three that happened with the facility and then there were 20-something thousand with the tsunami. Not really many deaths related to nuclear disasters in history. None at Three Mile Island. Chernobyl had some, and they still continue to feel the effects. Okay. But radiation scares people. It gets, it gets you. Although we're getting more today than I got inside both of these reactors all day when I visited them. And we had on these dosimeters. So we could measure it in miller, you know, micro rems or miller rems or something rems. Zero. So we, we, we have to kind of get right with what radiation is and what the scales of these things are as we look forward. They're waste protection. They're certainly expensive on the front end. And the risk of proliferation worries people, taking the plutonium and making weapon-grade stuff out of it. You still have to do a lot to it to go weapons-grade. It's not simple. It is nuclear science. Okay. 
about natural gas? <clears throat> Left of the white line is what we've consumed, and the right again at the right price is what's available a lot. Let's look at the conventionals and the unconventionals. Out in the Persian Gulf, they have one of the largest gas fields in the world. It's called the North Field. It produces from about 20 of these platforms, five wells each. They bring in those, those 100 wells or so produce almost three TCF of gas a year. You do the math on that, it's just phenomenal. Okay? And they think they have 900 TCF of reserves. 900 divided by three is about 300 years in this field. And what are they doing with it? They're exporting it around the world. They take these giant trains, they're called, which are huge facilities. There are Harry's there in the lower part of the photograph. You, go in, you walk in this thing, you look to the right, you can't see the end of it. You look left, you can't see the end. It's a kilometer long. There are seven of them. A, a, a city of 45,000 people. The whole purpose is to make it cold enough to become a liquid and put it on a tanker. It looks like this. These are giant tankers. A thousand feet long, more than three U.S. football fields, a football field wide and 10 stories tall. It's just a floating thermos. They load it with 144,000 tons of LNG, of, uh, LNG in, 12, in less than 12 hours. And then they send it off to the world, a tanker a day. When we were there, there was a Russian crew that was coming off the shift. <clears throat> and, and so they'd been out more than a month. And they'd been drinking by the time we got to them. So you know, I asked the captain, you know, Captain, have you ever been attacked? Because this was right when the Somalia attacks on the oil tanker. Only one time. I just went to vroom, and we swamped them. <laughs> How long did it take you to stop? Three days. You know. <laughs> These things are huge. It's a 30-foot diameter propeller, only one on the back of a drive shaft this big. It'll do 20 knots. Unbelievable operation in scale, okay? Let's go look at the unconventionals. In the U.S., natural gas peaked in the 70s. It plateaued, it's been coming back. So here's the reserves and production. We now have more production and reserves of natural gas than we ever have. So the peak was sort of just a, one kind of a peak and unconventionals come in here and have filled it in. Conventional gas through time, and here's the unconventionals. Tight gas, coal bed methane, and shale gas comprise the unconventionals. Over half of our natural gas now from these. Shale gas being the latest entry, but we've been fracking tight gas wells for 35 years. All across the Gulf of Mexico. You probably, you may not have heard about it until recently. But it's been going on for close to four decades. What do the shale basins look like? The Antrim shale has been around a long time in Michigan. Here's the Barnett shale. It's the granddaddy in Texas. We'll start building the Fayetteville, the Woodford, Haynesville, Marcellus, and the Eagle Ford in Texas as well. So now we're approaching five TCF of gas a year out of shales alone. The U.S. consumes less than 20. And look at the trend. All right, so these, this is a very important new source of natural gas for the world. I'm a geologist. I'm going to show you a picture of a rock. Suffer along. This is, this is a little different than you've seen, though. This is actually a highly magnified piece of the Barnett Shale. So those black things you see are the pores. That's where the natural gas is held. The little orange basketballs, burnt orange, are 20 nanometers across. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So we take a hypothetical pore throat with methane molecules, one carbon, four hydrogens. We're going to scale it down to that same size. So watch close. It almost goes away, but it doesn't. Some of these pore throats are 10 to 15 molecules wide. A molecule is really little, OK? We don't understand this system. Here's a human hair. It's not really one. I colored it to look like one. But it's the right width. 50 microns. I'm going to scale the pore system onto the hair. Here we go. Same scale. Now, these, this is our world now. This is what we try to teach here at UT and understand. We don't understand it very well. Neither does the industry. We're starting to as we get out there. Phenomenal volumes, though, because these are the source rocks. This is where the organic material was buried. 
and created oil and gas. So you're right into the source rocks now. The Barnett Shale development looks like this. I'm going to, up in the upper right hand corner is a 1997. You're going to see the year start to click off here. The black dots are vertical well bores, and the red dots are going to be horizontal well bores. Here comes 2003. And finally, in four, you really see the horizontals kick in. That's a lot of drilling. And I, I'm missing the last two years, about 16,000 wells now. Turns out we've gotten better. This is a pad right under the University of Texas at Arlington. And the green circle is where that well is located. And I'm going to show you the well paths under the earth from that well pad. There are 24 of them there from one well pad now that access that whole area just like they've done under the airport, et cetera. So the surface disruption is getting much smaller as more and more laterals can be drilled from the same pad, much different than when you started with all the vertical wells. Okay. The Barnett is not the only shale in the country, unless you haven't been reading for a year. You know, you've read about some of these things, the Marcellus, the Haynesville, the Fayetteville, Eagle Ford, Bakken, and others. And those aren't the only shales in the world. There's a lot of shale in the world. The Siberian Basin in Russia is bigger than Texas. Not the Barnett in Texas, Texas. Okay. There's a lot of shale in the world, and people are starting to look at it pretty hard. There's concerns all over the place about hydrofracking, which we can discuss in q and I'll just show you this picture. This shows you the depth of the hydrofracking. Every line is 1,000 feet, so picture that about this the same as the Empire State Building, each one of those. And then on the top is the freshwater aquifers. So you can kind of see all the different wells and they're how far away from the freshwater they are separated by rock. They get within about 3,000 feet in the Marcellus. That's a pretty good buffer. The blue line around there is the disturbed zone. That's the total disruption from hydrofracking measured by seismic data, micro seismic data. A lot of concern over water. So this is the water use in Texas uh, in thousands of, of acre feet per year. Shows municipal manufacturing. Mining includes oil and gas, steam, livestock, and irrigation. So you hear that oil and gas uses a lot of water, and it does, but really not relatively, okay? In fact, very little relatively. About the same as golf courses in Texas. So the irrigation of golf courses and hydrofracking are about the same volume. Um, hydrofracking is going up because there are more wells being drilled now. If you break that down a little bit, then in the oil and gas, coal, aggregates, and others, there's the mining part. So there's of that line, there's the part that is in oil and gas. And it's a lot of water. I mean, it would fill tons of swimming pools. I don't mean to mi minimize it. But in a relative sense, it's way below ag and industry. Okay. And here's how it's been used, 90s verse today. It, a lot of it was used for enhanced oil recovery before. Water floods, the blue line, today it's for completions, hydrofracking. But it ha the water use actually hasn't changed much in the oil and gas industry across three decades, two to three decades. It's just being used for different purposes in terms of volume. The implications of shale then, and this is a picture I took out of an airplane going into Fort Worth. That's what the vertical well spots look like. It's a lot. It's surface di disruption for sure. Now the pads are getting more dense. Traffic, noise, water, land use, radioactivity, carbon, these are some of the concerns on the environmental side. But it's certainly a versatile fuel, and we've got a lot of it. So energy security and fuel diversity are improved. Deliverability, access, the emissions. It's still a fossil fuel. When you combust it, it makes CO2, about half that of coal and oil, the water, these microquakes, really not from fracking. It's from the reinjection of the produced waters on occasion. Uh, it looks like the studies we've been doing and others, it looks like about 1% of the wells or so, of the injection wells, cause these microquakes, less than three on the Richter scale, sometimes a little more. Under three, you won't feel. Sometimes they're four, and you feel them. So not San Francisco. Buildings aren't falling down, but there are quakes. And there's reasons for that, and you can fix that. You can move the 
well away from the injection zone, you're usually crossing a geological fault. And I say educated regulation. This is a huge resource. If we're not going to use methane, then you're choosing coal or nuclear because those are the only three ways to baseload. So educated regulation kind of reminds me of this. Um, I say this is the EPA, and we're here to help you. Okay. It's actually the winner of the last photo taken contest. Um, <laughs> and there was a great runner-up. Here it is. So if the last slide was EPA, this is the industry, right? Hey, look what I found, you know, hydrofracking. Um, and you might want to look over your shoulder because the public and everybody else is kind of wondering what you're doing. And you should tell them. So we've got to get out there and be very communicative and transparent and balance the industrial activity with safety and environmental. And it can be done. Let's wrap it up with efficiency and security. So back to this figure, those of you who are close enough to see the numbers or seeing the bar wits recognize that in fact, less than half of went in and came out as, came out as useful work. More than half did nothing. It was just wasted. We waste close to 60% of the energy we put into our systems every single year. Mostly is heat. Heat up stacks and heat out of tailpipes of our cars. We can do a lot better. We can get more fuel economy. We can get better lighting. We can get better insulation so we don't lose heat out of buildings. Electronics can be better. Across the board, we can do better in efficiency. And we should. You won't even change your lifestyle. You know, we did this in my house. Um, no change in lifestyle. In fact, it's better. The insulation, the lighting, everything. We didn't make money on it because we're early in the game, so the economies of scale aren't there. We won't ever pay that out economically, but we're saving energy. Okay, so we felt better. Um, drive a little golf cart around and say, hey, we're in a golf cart. You know? There was a contest here in Austin for energy efficiency over the holiday season. This was the winner. Uh, uh, I asked my wife, Allison, can we be the ditto house next year? She said, no. Um, anyway, I'm, actually, this wasn't a contest, but I think it's pretty creative. So let's talk about security. What is energy security? I've mentioned it several times. It's available. We have access to energy. Affordable. Is the kilowatt hour inexpensive? Is the facility expensive to build? Is the price volatile? It all goes into affordability, okay? Is it reliable? Is the power intermittent? If it's intermittent, we need to baseload. Is it safe from potential harm from natural and human causes? Is it green? And clean is only one part of green. Green means dense. The land, a lot of environmentalists that I know are very concerned about the land and the footprint on that land. So how small can you make the footprint? How much energy density? Dry, fresh water, more and more use of water in energy systems. And finally, clean, the air emissions, carbon dioxide and other emissions. So clean is only one part of green. And they're not, dense isn't always in sync with clean. You saw the sol industrial solar takes a lot of land, but no emissions. So there's, there's trade-offs here. These things to me are all part of energy security. And if you look at them then, available, affordable, reliable, and green, by all the different resources, you can kind of score them. And I sent this out to very, very uh, non-rigorous. Just sent it about around to a bunch of different people. They filled out a scoring, and this was the averages. Green color here would be the best, yellow, OK, and red, not good. If you, if you look at the ones that tend to do the best then, it's nuclear and natural gas. They're available. The gas is very affordable, nuclear some. They're reliable, and they're reasonably green. Nuclear has no emissions and a very small footprint. Natural gas has a bigger footprint, but the emissions are better than coal and oil, for example. So you kind of come away from that and you say, in terms of baseload for this century, as we transition further into that energy world, nuclear and natural gas play big. So let's look at it. The left of the white line are real data. To the right are my forecast out to 2080. Green is 
oil in percentage. This is in percentage, not real units. So we peaked in 1979, just under 50% at oil, and it's down in the 30, low 30s today. Coal was coming down in percentage terms, spiked way up, China and India. And I'm calling for a plateau again in percentage, not real units. That depends on the demand. Natural gas is rising. Nuclear has flattened. But again, see a pretty important role for nuclear in the future. Dams are coming down and renewables are going up. And more steeply, that pink line than anything I forecast. Pretty bullish on them, but you have to solve this storage and transmission challenges to make them industrial scale. If you take that figure and now look at the exact same data, but with real units of something, so let's do that in quads. You can look at it in TCFs if you want. What does a decreasing percentage of oil mean? Well, it means an increasing consumption because we still have more people that are demanding more oil. It doesn't plateau till about 20, 40, or 50. Coal continues to rise even beyond that. Natural gas passes coal and oil. Exact same percentages. This is with about a one and a quarter percent demand growth globally, which is below some forecast. Nuclear, hydro, and then the renewables come up and actually are at the scale of the fossil fuels out there some 70 years. If I take those same lines and instead of plotting them all independently, let's just stack them up. It looks like this. Same exact thing. People look at that and they say, boy, that's just business as usual. Scott, you know, we can do, we can go faster, we can move quicker. I've shown you everything that feeds into that, including the renewables coming up really steeply, and that's what you get from nothing in 1980 of pink to a substantial portion out there in 2080. The yellow, blue, and green, which really didn't exist much on the left side 100 years later, are a significant part, but so are the fossil fuels. They're still there. In fact, if I stack, that's in percentage. If I stack the lower one up in real units, it looks like this. It doesn't start to plateau till about 2080. And that's as population peaks in around 2050 or 60 and starts to come off, but energy demand continues to grow. And this could be way off. You know, it's a forecast. But it's pretty consistent with a lot of the major forecasting entities around the globe. So what have we learned? Energy, the economy, the environment, they're linked. Um, choices are based largely on cost. Oil and coal are abundant at the right price and technology. They're going to be here for a while. They're very tough to replace. The energy density of, of liquid gasoline is very hard to replace. Renewables are great supplements. They're growing. They're going to remain supplements until we can make big advances in energy storage. Natural gas and uranium are the premier fuels of this century. Efficiency is underappreciated. It matters at all scales. Your behavior matters. You know, I, I speak a lot to people. When I'm in a hotel, I say, how many of you left the lights on in your hotel room? And people kind of look around and start fiddling with their Blackberry or something. You know, are you scared of the dark? Um, turn off your lights. You don't need them when you're not there. Why do we do that? So we got to change the way we think about energy and the way we use energy, and that happens with each of us. Energy security should be the goal of good policy. Available, affordable, reliable, sustainable, and, but you see the challenges of green, it means different things to different people. And the scale of demand is difficult to comprehend. So these supply transitions take a long time. And as we say, even if you had the perfect energy today, somebody walked up, Scott, here it is, it's perfect replace everything else. It'll take two to three decades to deploy that globally, just to commercialize and deploy it. 50 years to replace coal plants, two to three decades on the auto fleet, et cetera. So this, these infrastructure challenges drive the transition time. I'll leave you with this thought. Here's a guy in the Grand Canyon <coughs> taking a picture. And if you've been there, you know that the, the south rim is to his right. That's safety, and he's out there on some pillar with about 4,000 feet and leaves like this, wearing flip-flops. The cameraman says uh, he slipped and caught himself and threw his stuff up on top and climbed off and walked away. So he's an idiot, right? <laughs> yeah, just build a little bridge out there, buddy. 
uh, and walk over to safety. Because if you don't land that, you might land it, he did. But if you don't, the consequences are really extreme. And I feel that way about energy. As we look out in the future, the consequences of picking a winner incorrectly are really extreme. You end up with a very poor choice and a whole lot of money, and you're further behind. So let's do it in a way that's sort of thoughtful, systematic, and global as we move forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you.